Good morning. Uh, next presentation. The, um, it's good to be here again. We were, uh, Artifacts was at, at this conference last year. We had just formally uh, organized uh, the, uh, the organization and uh, had yet, yet to release uh, a product. Uh, it's wonderful to see the, the progress that, that the folks uh, here in the room today and many that aren't represented here have made in this, uh, made in this field. Um, we, what I'm here today to really speak to is the future of indexing and secondary publishing. And I have a colleague of mine, Jason Rollins, whom some of you may, may have already met, and I'd encourage you to, uh, to catch up with Jason here over the course of today. We're also going to be at the work, attending the workshop tomorrow and Thursday, where we will be uh, focusing on showing our products, uh, both what's currently live, what's in uh, our near-term and medium-term uh, road, uh, development roadmap. So our vision, where I'd, where I'd really like to begin is, is a reference, and I'd like to also echo a theme that, uh, that Yoris and Alex uh, began this morning, and it has to do with recognition. Uh, Eugene Garfield, quoting uh, Robert Merton, the Merton description of normal science describes citations as the currency of science. Scientists make payments in the form of citations to their preceptors. Our vision, the artifacts vision, is to change the outdated, inefficient process of how researchers receive credit for their work, breaking through existing delays and constraints, empowering researchers to collaborate in real time, share their work earlier in the process, and get credit they deserve every step of the way, advancing both their careers and simultaneously advancing research. So scholarly communications today, the published article is principally the single format of discoverable research today. Citations that are critical to discovery and researcher reputation are formally recorded for only a subset of published articles in indexes that are deeply retrospective, break prone, and inconsistent. And until artifacts arrived on the scene, there is no mechanism for linking and associating related and valuable research artifacts. This, inhib this inhibits discovery where research attribution cannot be formally received. Now, those of you who are researchers and who are tenured or pre-tenured, you all recognize that research, researchers depend on and universities spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year for these limited indexing and attribution tools. And while we know that research is, that discovery is, is a critical input to research and innovation worldwide, those li same limited data sets, those same limited indexes are relied upon for measuring performance, determine, determining hiring practices, as well as, uh, as well as tenure reviews. Tim Berners-Lee talks about, has talked about all of the data that's merely sitting in scientists' computers and currently not shared. The DORA Declaration, good science is good science regardless of where it is published. And we would, we would add to that by saying regardless of whether it's published. Because as we all know, there's a great deal of valuable science and knowledge that is never published, let alone indexed. And as John has pointed out, we're basically applying a 17th century communications format. Here we are in 2018. Now the lack of change, and everyone yesterday and probably throughout the rest of today, will lament the slowness of change here. And this is not merely, it's not just a, techno a technology problem. This is a reputation, recognition, and attribution problem from the artifacts perspective. So the model of scholarly communications that we like to begin with, moving from left to right, a project begins. Perhaps it's pre-funding, some research is done, a funding application is submitted, funding is received. 
the research begins, the data, the information, the artifacts that researchers generate throughout that initial and continuing phase of their research activities continues to build. That knowledge then begins to compress, and it compresses into an article form factor, and that further compresses in peer review, because not all the manuscripts that are, that are authored, that are submitted, are accepted for publication. And there is delay in that acceptance. Ultimately, works are taken through peer review, and we're hopeful that blockchain applications, such as, uh, such as what Joris and Alex uh, walked through, will begin to take hold in this arena. But ultimately, these published works, only a minority of them are indexed. Only 20% of the scientific, technical, medical publications are indexed. 80% of that content not being indexed makes it extremely difficult to find those resources, let alone any of the artifacts that are associated with those publications. So, artifacts allows research outputs to be indexed and cited from the earliest stages of research, creating persistent, link, persistent and linked chains of these transactions. So in brief, everything is indexed in real time while research is underway, with all artifacts linked and searchable. Intellectual property is established and managed by the creator. We very much respect the creator-owner relationship of intellectual property. And Transactions can occur there where intellectual, intellectual property rights move. Certainly that's the case with a manuscript, but it can also be the case with other artifacts that are generated throughout, throughout the research effort. Citations can be given at any point to research outputs at any time. So we're breaking the barriers and the boundaries of only being able to cite an article, only being able to cite a monograph possibly cite a patent. We're essentially enabling citation, citations to be given to any type of research. This facilitates, we believe, community sharing and will lower the barriers and the resistance and the fears and risks that, as we learned earlier, early, early stage researchers are oftentimes withholding information, and that's a common behavior throughout uh, most scientific disciplines. And what we believe we're, we're providing is a transparent and consistent data set that creates the ability for new types of analytics and dimensionality to citations. So for example, today, if Jason and I author a paper, we submit it to the catalysis system, it's processed, it's published, we're indexed, perhaps, by one of the indexes that are widely used. And one of you picks up our research, you conduct your work, you eventually publish and are indexed, you cite us. Now that may occur, that citation may occur five, seven years down the line. We're pleased to receive a citation. We have no idea why you've cited us. And so the dimensionality here that we speak of is providing contextual information, metadata, around a citation that illustrates or that describes the reason for the citation. Is it a confirmation? Uh, it were, were, was the other party unable to reproduce results? It could be anything in between or, or beyond that. Now, the Artifacts platform, we believe, can begin to address, certainly contribute, to addressing many of the issues that, that are listed here, whether it's certainly focused on reputation, research integrity, peer review, we believe we can, we can facilitate and, and complement, reproducibility definitely, and data access. But here's the crux of the challenge in secondary publishing, right? Primary publishers are the parties that, that publish the articles and the monographs. Secondary publishing is the echo effect. It's the indexing of the research itself, right? 
Well, the fundamental problem in this, in this field is that none of these, if you think of these indexes as bank accounts, None of these indexes agree. None of the balances agree. Which one is correct? Why is it correct? Which should we use? Which does our institution require? Which would I prefer? I mean, the numbers here are vastly different. Google Scholar has nearly 68,000 citations. Web of Science has a couple of different numbers itself, and that depends upon the content that is being viewed and used to accumulate those and measure those citations. If this were your bank account and you received, which bank would you rather go to, right? We'd all rather go to Google here. But if this were your bank account, it would make the entire system highly suspect. So the Artifacts Research Workflow Platform, which is live and in the wild today, we released it in March of this year, enables researchers and scientists to do three simple things establish proof of existence, authorship and confirm provenance at any time, protect and manage intellectual property, while concurrently, and importantly we believe, facilitating knowledge and content sharing, and to provide and receive valid breakproof attribution and assignment of credit at any point of research. So not only are we enabling researchers to establish proof of existence, proof of authorship, but we chain those artifacts together. If it, is a, if it is an artifact that evolves over time, a data set, a, a draft manuscript, uh, a protocol, et cetera, those modifications, those version changes are chained together, as well as the relationship of the set of artifacts that are involved, that are associated with the overall research project. So to make this happen now, we need more than the perspective solution. And the perspective solution is what we launched as, a, as an early stage release in March. That's what I've been speaking of. But let me turn attention to the added component that's necessary here, what we call the, the retrospective system. We've added an historical index here, because when artifacts launched in March, it began to accumulate, users started using it, it began to accumulate artifacts from live projects, from live work that was being conducted, and that content is progressively building over time. But we also know that scholars and scientists need to claw back, need to reach back into the literature and the research information that's available. So we know, we knew we needed to add some historical content. The historical research index uh, that, uh, that, that we will bring forward, that we're bringing forward, it will be better than today's existing tools. We're going to leverage the power of the community and provide systemic rigor that's required of an authoritative research solution. And we'll maintain research support through community ownership. So we will use a token-based system that will bring unprecedented curatorial power here. So, to model this out for you in terms of how the knowledge and how the information content builds over time, this first view illustrates how the, pro how the progressive index is, uh, is, is building out content. As we add the historical index, initially it comes in as an over 200 million record machine index data set. Well, there are lots of machine index data sets out there, right? But the curatorial power that we will bring to bear here is that we will rely on the community to correct those flaws, fill those gaps, and augment the historical record. So if your name is misspelled in a publication, uh, if, your, uh, if, there is other, if there are other errors in the bibliographic information, if, for example, the indexing that had been done didn't pick up four of your references because the indexer didn't also happen to index those publications, all of this historical content can be improved. To be sure, there are gaps, even in the 20% of the literature that's indexed, there are errors and flaws and gaps in that index. Furthermore, 
the community of researchers, we believe, will then go back to their prior publications and augment them with the research artifacts that are associated with them. And we believe the reason they will do this, the incentive for them to do this, is that this added knowledge is going to enable them to improve their, their ability to be recognized, to be discovered, to be credited, and overall contribute to the success of their research careers. So how does the system work and why will it work? It combines a token with a community engaged in curation activities. So a token will be used as compensation for, for curation. A community member holds tokens for stake in, histor in the historical index and they're able to spend it on services. And that's not a, that's not a, a one for one trade off. The stake that researchers, that the community creates for themselves in building that historical index will continue to grow over time and give them governance rights and authority over that historical index and ultimately ownership. The structure that we're, that we're applying here for that ownership is to create is to imbue a public benefit corporation with these tokens. So many of you would know the company Patagonia. Patagonia is structured as a PBC, a public benefits corporation. And that enables a nice hybrid of a, if you will, a commercial entity to engage actively in, commercial, in, in public good. Not only will we give the community rights and ownership over this historical index, but artifacts will feed proceeds back to the research community in the form of funding that this community governing the allocation of those funds will be able to allocate to research. Not that we're anticipating becoming the next National Institutes of Health that annually funds 32 billion a year in research, but we do want to make sure we find a way to give back to the community, and that's the vehicle. So the community, um, the community recognition for curating levels and expertise and, and quality. There will be challenges and quests. As I referred to earlier, there are gaps and errors and flaws uh, in, in the historical index. My colleagues and I, Jason and I, have worked for many years building those indexes and we're quite familiar with where they are and we know where to point the research community to make further improvements and enhancements. And an important point here in the trailer is that we're not the first to ask researchers to contribute to building something, particularly in the area of indexes and archives. But in the past, they received nothing tangible for this effort, perhaps other than personal gratification, and they ultimately own nothing. Here they will receive incentives, recognition, and own what they build. So the, the ecosystem here that I'm illustrating, our concept is and our vision is to coexist within the existing research and development ecosystem. We're realists. We respect open science. We also respect that there is an extremely mature and diverse set of stakeholders that facilitate both the funding of science, the creation of science, and the communication of science. And we believe it's incumbent upon us to operate and, and to play nice with, with all stakeholders. Our intention is to live in the researcher's workflow and, and engage with trusted enterprises. So I'm hopeful that maybe perhaps not as soon as this conference next year, but in the near future, we won't be talking about blockchain applications. You know, the subtitle of my talk won't be a blockchain approach. It will be how we live in the researcher's workflow and facilitate and advance their research, their career goals. So I've, I've spoken about the researchers a bit. Uh, the bottom comment, uh, the lower circle in the lower left, I think is important because that illustrates our intention to integrate and interoperate in the tools and applications that researchers are using. So that artifacts is operating in the background. 
In the future, you won't even have to know that artifacts is there. If you're in an electronic lab notebook and where, where, where your lab's uh, data are all being compiled and so forth, we'll provide a plug-in, we'll provide an API, or work with that, that third party's application so that proof of existence, proof of creation, citations given and such can operate as researchers are using the tools that they're customary uh, that are customary in their in their daily workflow, but also importantly, beyond the index uh, that we're building and, and the expansion of knowledge that we believe uh, it will deliver, it's incumbent on us to interoperate with all of the key stakeholders, whether they're funding organizations, universities, publishers, corporate R and D organizations, and societies, and certainly the open community. As a co-founder of ORCID, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to hear Rob's presentation yesterday and hear the progress that they've, that they've made. There's much more to do there. I think, I think we all recognize that. Um, it's, uh, it's also nice to be able to also say that um, you know, the, the persistent identifiers that Rob spoke of yesterday, Artifacts is in a position to support those. They're machine readable and they are persistent. And and supporting that PID infrastructure is valuable, not only for the open community, it's valuable for research broadly. Uh, this is just a bit on our timeline. Um, uh, we're, um, we're pleased with our progress, and we're, we're also uh, frustrated uh, as any developer, as any new developer would be, uh, on the time that it takes to actually bring product and evolve product to market. And, and the points that Joris made earlier about legal legal complications and, 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 and constraints certainly compounds the challenge in this market. We're extremely pleased to have University of Saskatchewan as our first academic partner that's standing up a node for, for artifacts. Uh, they will become uh, an important both research partner uh, and, uh, and, and trusted node in supporting our system. Our co-founders are listed here across the top, our advisors uh, across the bottom, and, uh, and again, Jason Rollins, who drives our product development efforts uh, very pleased to be here today. Our vision, you've seen this before, with the exception of the final point at the bottom. We want to let scientists do science. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, there's one. Thank you for the nice presentation. As a science communication professional, I remembered one article from 2014 published in uh, Genome Biology, mm -hmm. and it is mentioning a Cardassian index for scientists who are at the social media and are dissecting uh, the, the, social, uh, the scientific results to the public. Can that be an artifact? Can that be part of artifact uh, uh, yeah, the platform? what scientists actually share with the society. Can a museum exhibit with the expertise of a scientist be part of the artifacts? So, so clarify again what the specific artifact there is. W what is the artifact there? Yes. 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 So, uh, I think that the simplest way to think of artifacts is that any digital representation can become an artifact, and if it's citable, uh, whether it's cited or not, it certainly can become an artifact. So, if it's a blog comment, yes. Although I'd have to say that our focus here is around is around enabling citations to citable materials. So any type, of, any type of contribution that a researcher makes that is in digital form certainly can become an artifact, yes. Sanke. That's an interesting thing. And you, you, do you have any plans to influence like what will be an artifact, like in terms of like the size? Or I mean, a, a tweet can like contain a great idea or a, like a one-shot picture of like a new finding can be like very important, where of like uh, mm -hmm. other things can be very long and unimportant. So, and you, you have you have it now in your hand to influence its culture, right? 
No. Well, yes, I think uh, influence is, is a yes, I think we're in a position to influence. I think we're very much going, to, first of all, there is no restriction in terms of file size or no, the yeah. type of information content. And I should also point out that Artifacts never takes possession or control of the content. We certainly have a facility where researchers uh, can, can store content, but we interface with commonly used, uh, commonly used resources Dropbox, GitHub, and, and, and others, and, and in a corporate R&D setting, we would certainly engage with, with any private storage facilities. We don't take control and ownership of the artifact. Mm -hmm. We can influence this process, but we're very much going to turn those types of questions back to the research community, and specifically the scientometric community, to help us, help us determine. Um, I speak of contextually relevant citations. Well, we have our ideas as to what context should be, should, that a citation should be, uh, should be incorporated in a citation. But we don't, we don't want to be the party to try to unilaterally push our views on the research community. That needs to emerge from the community itself. So that's a great example of if it is a citable item, we want the scientometric, bibliometric community to help us work through uh, the, uh, the, the metadata requirements for contextual relevance, if, the, if that addresses your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk, Dave. Um, I had a question. You said the University of Saskatchewan mm -hmm. is, has the first trusted node for a mm -hmm. university partner. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the blockchain technology you're using? Is it a permissioned Ethereum blockchain, or what exactly is it? Sure, sure. So we're, um, we're, in a, uh, we're betwixt and between. We're in the process of migrating. So when we initially stood Artifacts up, uh, stood the, uh, you know, released the, the product uh, in March, uh, we, were using, um, we were using an off-chain uh, variant of Ethereum, and transactions were recorded and, and able to be viewed through Ropsten. Now, th that was basically a test environment for us to have something that was up and working. We had a, we have a, pro we had a project uh, workspace to be able to accumulate artifacts, to be able to associate artifacts. Uh, to give and receive attribution and so forth. Um, we're in the process now of, in the next sprint or two, probably the second sprint from where we sit today, there will be one in, Mar there will be one in November uh, and one uh, uh, probably six weeks down the road. We're in the process of migrating to Hyperledger Sawtooth. Now, in terms of nodes, these are permissioned nodes. So we envision having some n number of permission nodes that support this ecosystem. We, our preference is to have representation from the key types of stakeholder organizations. Again, universities, as we start with Saskatchewan, funding organizations, publishers, certainly, um, societies, uh, and, and, the open, and the open community. So it will be a permission node system, and there are several reasons for that. Um, maybe the two to highlight are the economics. It's, it's very cost effective with the, kind, with the volume of transactions that this system over time needs to scale to. It will be very cost effective to take that approach. Secondly, it's important for us to engage with the organizations that house or directly support the researchers whom we want to use the system. So whether they're funders, whether the universities, all of those stakeholder organizations, we believe that adopt standing up a node as trusted parties uh, will have an incentive to encourage their, their communities to use the system, if that answers your question. Sure. So, sure. and we have one last question here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry about this. I'm really curious about your name, Artifacts, because in physics and in natural sciences and in signal processing, artifacts are actually an error you see in your experiments. It does not exist. So mm -hmm. when you're uh, sending a paper, and maybe you have an image, and you say, oh, this is like the greatest thing in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, it's actually a piece of dust, we call that an artifact. And so I'm actually quite curious about your name generation here. Cause, um, yeah. Yes, um, uh, it, it, that's an interesting fact that we were, we were perhaps not aware of. Uh, the, the derivation of the name, um, art from the social sciences, humanities, Set, set of disciplines, art, and facts from, if you will, the hard sciences. sciences. So it, it's an attempt to be uh, supportive across all disciplinary fields and such. Thank you for that comment.
All right, thanks.